Now, the first question you'd ask, free Negroes in a time of slavery? How could that be? But it was. And the next question would be, well, how did they come to be free? How did it happen that there were free Negroes during a time of slavery? There were several ways in which they were freed. We'd really have to look back to the time when the first group of Negroes were sold by a Dutch man of war in Virginia, the first time for the English in the colonies. And they were sold as indentured servants. Slavery had not yet evolved, so to speak, in the colonies. But indentured servitude was what did the work in the colonies in the beginning, the indentured servants. And some of them were able to work off the indenture and receive the benefit of the indentured servants. Now, the indentured servants worked from five to seven years, and <laughs> at the end of that indenture, they were given a small piece of land, a small bit of money, <laughs> a new suit, and they were on their own. The unfortunate thing is, though, <coughs> that the people to whom they were indentured were not always kind. And in many instances, they died before they were able to work off the indenture. So it was really, in many ways, a cruel system. And frequently, the indentured servants, when they had a chance, ran away. Negro, and of course, if they were white, they could blend right into the population. It would be difficult to find them. But with the Negroes, <laughs> they could not blend into the population. And they'd be a standout wherever they went. So it was easier for the system of slavery to evolve for the Negroes than it was in some instances to keep the indentured servants indentured. So over a period of time in all of the colonies, that system evolved into slavery to the extent that they were indentured in perpetuity. And their offsprings were also indentured. Now, it was not unusual in many instances for indentured servants that were white and black to marry each other. But that was not good for the evolution of the system of slavery because the question would be, then what would the offspring be, white or colored? So then the states, not the states, the colonies, moved into another stage of law in that just a drop of Negro blood made you a Negro. And they passed laws against the marriage of black and white. So then you had isolated a dark-skinned group of people, unprotected, and easily identified who made up the labor supply that was so badly needed in the colonies. They were enslaved in perpetuity and they were bought and sold <clears throat> just like chattel, chattel slavery. So you had what evolved into a distinct system of slavery in the colonies. Now, they also ran away, but they were not able to blend into the population as easily as were the whites. <laughs> 
Now we come to the question of how they got to be free. On different plantations, there were different degrees of relationship and different qualities of relationship. In some instances, there were masters who were compassionate and appreciative of their slaves. They were slaves, but they recognized that the better they treated the slaves, the more work they could get from them. In addition to that, those who lived close, like the cooks, like um, valets and butlers and maids constantly coming in contact with the owners of the plantation. They had a closer relationship and in many instances came to have real affection for each other within that system. One of the first instances in which a group of freedmen grew up, there were some men who came to this country and worked very hard and acquired and worked their slaves very hard and recognized that they were able to acquire and become wealthy because of the work of their slaves and they would free them on their death. Maybe they would free a butler. Maybe they would free a driver. But they, are free, they freed them out of appreciation for what they had done to help them acquire. They freed them frequently in such a way as to set up trusts for them so that they would be protected for the remainder of their lives because it would be extremely difficult to live as a free Negro when the status of Negroes was that of slaves. Where would you go? Where would you live? Who would take care of you? How would you exist from day to day? That would become the question. Going back to the evolution of slavery, there were some Negroes in this country then who had never been slaves. They came as indentured servants, they worked off the indenture, and then they became freemen where they were. And that group, their descendants, would be those people who had never been slaves. Now that would be a very small group, but that would make up a free group. The group that would, the group freed by the masters would make up a free group. At the last meeting of the class, we were talking about the larger number of mulattoes in this section. And some fathers were very considerate of their children. And they kept their children and read them as free and in time freed them. And they freed them in many different subtle ways so that they could move right into the white population. Now children of such a union, quote unquote, frequently were very fair in color, not always. They would sometimes take on the coloration of the mother and sometimes be of color in between the mother and the father. And then sometimes they would be very white skinned. If they were very white skinned, then it would be easy to send them north or some other place and free them. There are many subtle ways in which that group became free. And some of them left the region and some of them stayed and lived in the region. Now David has talked to you about this family that came from Africa and established itself in Georgetown. They were all free 
one of the largest and most prominent free Negro families was in Sumter, the Elliots. But that would give us a group of freedmen. There was another way in which they won freedom. Many of them were artisans, blacksmiths, silversmiths, and worked in the selected arts. And in many instances, what the plantation owners did they would let them go to Charleston and work, set themselves up and work in Charleston. And they moved about as freedmen. But the money that they made came back to the plantation owner and they gave the artisan some part of that. Many of these people were able to accumulate enough money to buy their freedom. And some of them not only bought their freedom, but they bought the freedom of their family members. So there were several ways in which they became free. Now, Georgetown was an active seaport Charleston was the most active seaport in the state and in some ways in the South so far as slave trading was concerned. And in Charleston you had a very cosmopolitan population. It had the largest Jewish population in the United States at one time. And it had a very large free Negro population. And the free Negroes, according to what they did, varied from being wealthy to very poor. And in one instant, we have a record of a freedman who went to the courts and asked to be enslaved again because he could not take care of himself and he needed someone to help him take care of himself. That would be extremely unusual. Within the group, there was division. The extremely light-skinned Negroes seemed to think that they were very much better than the very dark-skinned Negroes. That was a belief that was perhaps engendered and promoted by the masters because they recognized the more they could divide the slave population, the more secure would be their control. And someone really ought to write a dissertation on group control when you think in terms of the large number of slaves over and against the small white population. And they were able to control them by dividing them. On the plantations, we've mentioned the drivers. The driver was perhaps the highest position of leadership, and that would be quote, unquote, for leadership that they had, and they placed him over and against the field hands and kept them divided. And then there were people who came into the colony, we begin with the colony and later the state, who were already free. And then we want to see the growth of the free Negro population in South Carolina. We are looking at the Charleston District. We are looking at the city of Charleston. We are looking at Buford. And we are looking at Georgetown. Now notice that each of these were seaports. In 1790, 
there were more than a thousand free Negroes in South Carolina. Now, 1790 is important to us because we associate that with the first census of the United States. The American Revolution was over. The United States, as a democratic republic, had been established. And this is what the first census showed. And let's jump from 1790 down to 1860. 1860 is important because 1860 would be at the beginning of the Civil War. And in 1860, there were more than 9,000, almost 10,000 free Negroes in the state of South Carolina. Let's go back to 1790, however, and look across there and notice that in Georgetown, at that time, there were 113 free Negroes. In Buford, 153. In the city of Charleston, only 586. But in the Charleston district, you had 950. And on down the line. Let's look at 1820, and we would choose 1820 because that would bring us just two years, um, yes, two years before the Denmark VC insurrection. And notice how the population had increased in the state. There were six, better than 6,000 free Negroes in the state. Of that, more than 3,000 were in the district of Charleston. And in the city of Charleston alone, there were more than 1,000. Let us look and see that in Beaufort, 181, and let's make sure I'm looking straight across here. And in, um, we're looking at 1820. In Georgetown, 227. Notice how that population for Georgetown had gone up and down. In 1790, 113. In 1800, only 95. But in 1810, 102. And by 1820, 227. But notice that in 1860, it had decreased and there were only 183. We want to remember that after the Denmark VC insurrection, the state passed laws prohibiting freeing Negroes and prohibiting free Negroes to come into the state because V.C. was free and he had drawn largely on the free population as they planned the insurrection. Does that remind me of uh, how one became indentured? One sold oneself into indenture in many instances. But as the need grew for laborers as they came into the colonies. <laughs> All you had to do was to be so unwitting as to be young enough and strong enough and go to a pub in England and get drunk. And then when you woke up, you found yourself on the high sea in a ship pitching and that was called Shanghai. They Shanghai'd a lot of 
young men out of England. And then, well, you had to pay for your passage. You're on your way to the new world. So to work your passage off. So notice how unkindly not only the Negroes were treated, but all you had to do was be poor and peasant and stupid and unprotected. But in most instances, people sold themselves into indenture because they felt that in the free world, in the new world, after they worked their indenture off, they were strong and healthy and they could make it for themselves. And many did, and some did not. <clears throat> now in 1790, Notice the state is divided into the Tidewater region. That's the low country. It's divided into the lower pine, lower pine belt, the upper pine belt, and the Piedmont. And notice where the free Negroes were concentrated in the Tidewater section. Do you see that? And are there any questions? There were almost no free Negro, Negroes in the Piedmont section, but they were overwhelmingly concentrated in the Tidewater section. Let's look next at 1830. And in 1830, there came to be a few more Negroes in other sections, but the Negro population, the um, free Negro population had increased in the Tidewater section. And then if you look at 1860, what do you see? I don't seem to have an 1860. Did you put 1860 on for us, please? Okay. Notice the concentration is still in the Tidewater section. Now, are there any questions that you want to ask about that? Were the three Negroes just traveling? away from where they had originally been? Was that how they In some instances, and I'm glad you've asked that question, because um, it varied throughout the period of slavery. See, at first, as they became free, in many instances, it took an act of the legislature to free them. And there would be no difficulty if a master um, specified in his will that Tom or Jane was to be free. Then later, as the feeling grew against free Negroes, then the state began to enact laws, first that prohibited freeing the Negro, second that prohibited free Negroes immigrating to this state. And if you look at your first um, breakdown of free Negroes that I showed you here, you can see how the population went up and down. And you can see particularly in Georgetown County how it was affected by the enactments after 1822. Any other questions on that? But in many instances in Charleston, they lived extremely well. And even at a time when it was prohibited by state law to teach slaves to read and write, in Charleston, they had private schools. Now, are there any other questions there? Yes. About when was it when they passed the rule that you couldn't free your slaves? 
1820, David said. You said in Charleston, some of them were being educated in schools. Yes. Was that due to the fact that uh, now their schools, artists? they were not state schools, and right. they were not public schools. Were These were private schools. Was part of that due to the fact that some of those people were artisans and, and they were Oh yes, it? yes, a part of that, but it was more basic than that. It, they educated them because they were, they were their children and they could afford it. But I, I could see people winking at the whole thing if they knew that the reason for it was to maintain a, a product that was required and needed in the community. Well, it could, could have been. I'm sure they had schools that we would now call technical schools in addition to, you know, schools for general ed education, like teaching them a simple thing like reading and writing. And every census taken from 1790 to 1800 it indicated that there were black who owned slaves. In 1800, Elias Collins owned 68 slaves. John Williams owned seven in 1810. John Gardner owned 40 slaves. Elias Collins owned 11. Simeon Holmes owned eight. 11. A number of black owned slaves owned into the 1830s, 1840s, on up until the beginning of the Civil War. And that's where we come to Robert Michael Collins, who had the large rice plantation in Santee and owned a number of slaves. How did these slaves make out, ex slaves make out after the Emancipation Proclamation? It was a problem. Before that, most of them, especially on the Robert Michael Collins plantation, he had a problem feeding his family, feeding his slaves. The slaves stayed. In a lot of cases, they had no place to go. They were free, but you are free. In a country you know nothing about, where are you going? So a lot of them stayed on the plantation with the plantation master with agreement. You feed us clothes and keep a roof over our head and we will work. That's what they did on Robert Michael Collins' plantation. But after the, right after the Civil War, he had a problem in feeding not only his slave, but he had a problem in feeding his family. And that's when the Freedmen Bureau came in under General O. O. Howard. They were supposed to take care of the freedmen after they were freed to see that they got a place to say something to eat, etc. And one year, Robert Michael Collins had to go to the Freedmen Bureau and borrow money so that he could get food for the slaves and his family. And I think the amount was about less than $50. But that gave him about 100 pounds of bus meat, so many bushels of corn. And along with that, it wasn't a gift, a bill came, $49.53. And it took Robert Michael a year to pay off that $49.53. The one thing he learned as a result of what he went through during the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, when all slave masters had to sign contracts with slaves if they wanted slaves to work for them, Robert Michael found out that he could get slaves to work by paying them a salary. And the first time he did, he paid them $1,000 one year for all of his slaves to work on the plantation. So it proved that paying salaries would get work out of slaves. Now the free people in Georgetown during this period were not permitted <coughs> to vote or hold public office. But they had to pay a $2 tax every year, which brought about a problem in a lot of cases. The list you have of the free Negroes in 1860 in Georgetown, the list indicated those who had personal property and real estate. And if you figure that up, in 1860, out of 183 free Negroes, 46 were mulattoes, 77 were free Negroes who owned property, 
and real estate. And the amount of real estate they own came to a total of $9,300. And the amount of personal property they own came to $9,850. Most of this information is gotten out of Bryant's book on the contribution of blacks to Georgetown political and economic. Would you tell them how that came to be written, David, please? Bryant book was written by a group, a black group of individuals out of Georgetown who were attending South Carolina State University. <coughs> Dr. Bryant, head of the social studies department of the institution, and wanted some research done on the history, African American history of Georgetown. And a number of individuals, I may have the name of some of them somewhere here, Ojeda, Smith, who was a Parker then, and then Mary Barnes, took it as a research to do on Georgetown history. And they researched and came up with the entire history, African American history of Georgetown, to that period, so that he could use it as a dissertation, on his, on his dissertation for his work. But the information was handed down to me by one of the members of that group back in the late 80s. We had, for a town as small as, a county as small as Georgetown County, a large number of free Negroes. My concern would be now, what did they do to make a living? And how did they live? I don't know that we have any specific information on that. We just have the statistics. I do, however, <clears throat> want to call to attention the Grimke family. They are not of Georgetown. They are of Charleston. So they would be of the Tidewater section. I think I mentioned at the last meeting of the class there was a Judge Grimke in Charleston who had two daughters Angelina and Sarah, and a son. And each of those daughters became abolitionist. One of the things that the literature frequently is eloquently silent on is the activity of Southern abolitionists. After the abolitionist movement started, the largest number of societies were in the South. And I must bring you some information <coughs> on that. But in many instances, they would have to work underground. But it's testimony to the fact that there were Southerners who were actively opposed to slavery. I mentioned at a previous meeting of the class that for this county and Charleston, Charleston James Pettigrew and Joel Poinsett were unionist. They were among the men who felt that it was stupid to secede from the union that it was stupid to continue to support slavery. Now, the Grimkes are very important because of their brother. I think I also previously mentioned that he had children with one of the slave women on one of their plantations. Now, um, the judge was a slave owner, but his daughters became very active abolitionists in the Philadelphia area. They found out that their brother had children with this slave woman, and these young men had made their way to Philadelphia. And those women 
supported them and helped them to become educated and they became very prominent men. I uh, don't know as much about the specifics of the f life of the free Negro in Georgetown County as I'd like to know. But the statistics show, the record shows that there were, there was a large number. On checking all of the census, it was found that very few of them, if any, made much of a, a bare living. They could do a lot of things. They could do good with both ships. They could make uh, sails, wait on table, and things of that nature. So very few, if any, made of anything above a bare living. And the more affluent, quote unquote, of the free Negroes themselves owned slaves, sometimes only one, more frequently none at all, but among them were slave owners. Now are there any questions? No questions. All right. With that, we'll go to the Civil War. <laughs>